Okay. Um, good morning, everyone, and welcome to uh, today's Government Affairs Forum. I'm Jim Rooney, President and CEO of the Greater Boston Chamber of Commerce, and today we're pleased to welcome Massachusetts Attorney General Mara Healy uh, as our guest speaker. Um, as the Chamber and all of us continue to adapt to this unprecedented time, uh, the Chamber remains committed to serving as the voice of Boston's greater Boston's business community. Uh, and we've been pleased to do that over the last six years alongside our Attorney General, Mara Healy, who continues to fight for justice and equal rights for every member of our community. Uh, each year, we're thrilled to have the Attorney General join us to discuss her priorities and the work her office is doing to advocate for and protect the people of Massachusetts. Uh, and this is particularly timely event today, given the heightened tensions felt across our country and across the globe right now, uh, the opportunity to hear from our Attorney General, General uh, Massachusetts people's lawyer is indeed a, a great one today. Before we get started, I'd like to begin with a huge thank you uh, to our sponsor, Bank of America, uh, who has been our longstanding partner for these government affairs uh, forums, and we hope to get back to doing them live and in person uh, soon, but thank you to Hall Chamberlain, Massachusetts President of Bank of America, uh, for not only their continuing support of the Chamber, uh, these forums, but also the way they've stepped up uh, during this COVID-19 crisis, just continuing what Bank of America has done uh, for a long time and being a contributing member to our community. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be shared on the Chamber's YouTube page shortly after the presentation. Uh, and lastly, be sure to submit your questions throughout the webinar using the Q&A feature on your screen uh, or by emailing chamber programs, one word, chamber programs at bostonchamber.com. With that, it's my honor to introduce our speaker this morning, Attorney General Mara Healy, who is currently in her second term in office Attorney General Healy has placed much of her focus uh, on confronting the opioid epidemic, reducing gun violence, enforcing civil rights, protecting consumers, and addressing the climate crisis head on. The Attorney General has also championed access to healthcare, access to healthcare and reproductive freedom here in Massachusetts. Before serving, um, before being elected as Attorney General, um, Mara serves as chief of the Civil Rights Division, where she served as lead counsel in the country's first successful challenge to the Defense of Marriage Act. Please join me in welcoming Massachusetts Attorney General Mara Healy. Um, thank you for the opportunity, Jim and Michal, for me to be with you this morning. I had a speech ready for today to talk about what we're doing to address the COVID crisis. But you can all look at my COVID-19 webpage for that. And while I'm really proud of my team for all that they've been doing, um, and I'm grateful to our healthcare, amazing healthcare institutions, the companies that have hustled to donate and secure and even make PPE, the frontline workers who battle to save lives, I'm not going to talk about that today. We live in uncertain and urgent times. And it's against this urgency and uncertainness that I speak today. This pandemic has exposed the fragilities in our system, our reliance on a global supply chain, the fact that most Americans lack savings for the next month's rent, their student loan payments, or even to buy food. A system that's left our oldest generation dying alone in under-resourced nursing homes. A federal administration lacking confidence and compassion to deliver direction, facts, and basic supplies. It's also allowed us to envision new ways of work from everything from how we go to work, travel, and vote, reducing our carbon footprint too. But the thing I've spoken most about is that this pandemic has revealed and exacerbated the disparities that black and brown residents endure. And that's been true for 400 years, 400 years of racism and oppression. 400 years that we must acknowledge, own, and fix. So I won't talk about rebuilding. Instead, I'll talk about building anew in ways that rid us of the institutionalized racism that's led to America burning today. 
we have a once in a lifetime opportunity. And the challenge I pose to all of us this morning is will we seize it? If we don't, we'll extinguish the promise of this great country, the hard work of good people who've gone before us and the hopes for generations to come. I come to you every year because I believe the chamber and its members have the capacity to make real change happen. And today, I beseech you. I begin with the murder of George Floyd. Last Tuesday, I called the Minnesota AG. I said, Keith, what the F, what's happened? He shared with me what he knew. Some of it's public, some of it isn't. But suffice it to say, this is another senseless killing by people who didn't respect and value another person's life. I say people and not one person because the police officers who stood by and watched, who are clearly not fit to wear the badge, were complicit in this killing. I was angry, so angry, and ready to fight. And then I was numb. And now I've moved to a place of resolve. In February, it was Ahmaud Arbery, shot dead simply for exercising, something I see people do every day on the Esplanade. Last week, it was George Floyd, recently laid off from his job due to COVID, killed by a police officer who pressed his knee on George's neck while the life visibly drained from his body. Then the video from Central Park, the threat by an entitled white woman against Christian Cooper, who was simply minding his own business studying birds. Ahmad, George, Christian, yes, in different situations, but in the same circumstance of being black. I can't imagine how it feels to be black right now. The color of my skin doesn't allow me to truly understand what it's like to leave your home and automatically be subjected to so many assumptions and biases. For the white people on this call, go ask your black and brown colleagues what it's like to be questioned by security while going into your office building on a weekend, to be pulled over driving home from work, to have people assume you got into college or got the promotion simply to check a box. To feel the pain of having to instruct your children how to navigate rides on the subway, go out with friends after a basketball practice, go to a movie theater or a store, even date for fear they will be treated with suspicion at best and detainment or death at worst. As Attorney General, my office has taken on the NRA, Purdue Pharma, and an occupant of the White House who routinely does harm to our basic way of life and the protections we hold dear. If there's anything I wanted to do as AG though, it was to address the centuries long systemic racism that plagues all aspects of our society. And I've fallen short. I know this from the threats and fears that are as palpable as ever. And we need look no further than the COVID pandemic we're facing today. I don't know that we'll ever come to grips with the magnitude of the loss felt over these past months. So many have lost loved ones and done it without even being able to hold their hand and say goodbye. It's heartbreaking, each and every case. I know everyone here has someone in their family or who they know who's had to confront this devastating illness. But there have been other kinds of suffering that we need to acknowledge too. The Asian American doctors in Boston who've been taunted by racist threats as they travel from their homes to hospitals to save lives. The disproportionate infection rates in black and brown communities. The recent report my office released on high air pollution rates in communities of color and attendant illness. The number of essential workers who were people of color the people in food pantry lines that stretch city blocks waiting for diapers, food, and masks. The parents who don't have internet access or tablets or the time to homeschool because they have shifts to work. And now, compounding all of this is torment, vestigial and acute, of seeing a white person who thought it was okay to jam his knee into the back, into the neck of a black person. As we reopen, we can't go back. For this country to survive, 
The new normal we build must address the deep inequities that the COVID crisis has exposed. Now, I don't pretend to have the playbook, but here are a few places I think we can start. Let's talk about our workers. This pandemic has tested our workforce and our assumptions about who exactly is an essential worker. Our essential workers are doctors, nurses, and first responders for sure. But this crisis has shown that they're also grocery store and pharmacy employees, custodians, delivery drivers, rideshare drivers, and warehouse and food production workers. They are disproportionately people of color. These workers have put their health on the line to get us through this crisis. And many have done so while being among the lowest paid workers in our economy. They need livable wages and benefits. And as we begin to reopen our economy, the health and safety of our workers must be a top priority. Those who stand to profit most from this crisis need to do everything possible to keep their employees safe. Large companies like Amazon have made millions during this pandemic. If Jeff Bezos can spend billions on his own space travel company, he can surely afford to make sure his own hourly workers have PPE during a national health crisis. A part of supporting workers, and I know this is near and dear to the chamber, is prioritizing accessible quality childcare. Let's be clear, access to childcare was an issue of equity before this crisis. Lack of childcare disproportionately impacts single parents, hourly workers, and two working parent families. I agree with the chamber. If we expect parents to return to work, they need childcare. We need a plan to open childcare centers safely and as soon as possible. And if we wanna build a more equitable society beyond this crisis, we need a plan to make sure every family has access to affordable childcare. But there's more to it. Our childcare workforce was vulnerable even before COVID. And many of our centers are now in danger of shutting down. Our early childcare workers in Massachusetts earn an average of about $30,000. 92% of the workforce is female and 41% are people of color. We need to do more to support them financially. Massachusetts received 45 million in federal money, but it hasn't been distributed yet. Those funds should be provided as soon as possible and will need more. I hope you'll join me in calling for additional funding for early childhood education. Finally, this pandemic has tested our state's healthcare system. In the face of tremendous pressure, we've seen innovation and collaboration like never before. But the pandemic underscores an urgent challenge in our healthcare system. Entire communities are being left behind. Data on COVID cases and deaths painfully illustrates what we already know. Your zip code is a better predictor of health than your genetic code. So what do we do? If there's one thing we've learned from this pandemic, it's that neglecting health for some people jeopardizes health for all people. We've seen the price of systemic underinvestment in the health of low-income communities and communities of color. It's time to correct these disparities and ensure that as we recover and build, we do it equitably. We need to reimagine how we deliver health care and how we pay for it. One place to start this work is telehealth. The success of telemedicine during this pandemic has exceeded everyone's expectations. We should adjust our policies and regulations permanently. But we also need to make sure that the expansion of telehealth doesn't worsen existing disparities by leaving behind low-income, older, rural, and non-English speaking people. That means tackling the digital divide, Increasing the availability of free or reduced cost smartphones and data plans for low income families. Multilingual digital literacy campaigns. Done right, technology enabled medical care can be an equalizer, but it has to be built around the needs of people who have been on the losing side of our healthcare system for too long. We've also seen great models of mobile health in communities, and we should build on those and we need to save our community hospitals. Those are a few policy suggestions in the areas of healthcare, childcare, and work. There are many more across other realms from transportation to housing to employment 
to criminal justice reform. We need to explore them now. Changing policies and laws is important, but it isn't enough. For things to really change, to really change, we need to embrace a collective cultural mind shift. Racism has been embedded in our country from the time that Europeans plundered our first Americans and Africans were stolen from their land, shackled and brought to our shores. I support calls for a revolution, but not the revolution of violence in our streets. Instead, I'm calling for a revolution in mindset, a fundamental change to our ingrained assumptions. Ingrained assumptions aren't the fault of those of us who hold them today. They're the product of centuries. We must change that and not be defensive about it. It's okay. Today, I'm challenging myself and my office to learn and internalize all we can about structural racism, where it exists and how it came to be. To do that, we need to listen to people of color. They live it every day and they can tell us. And when they tell us, we need to believe them. So I ask you to challenge yourselves as well. Many people have been looking for ways to do something. Here are some suggestions, starting in your personal life. Educate yourself on the history of race and racism in America. Read articles, books, listen to podcasts. Don't just rely on black and brown people to educate you. Educate yourselves and educate your kids too. Second, speak out. Don't let the casual slur, prejudiced comment, or microaggression slide by. Do the uncomfortable and take it on. That may momentarily make the meeting, golf round, dinner with friends, or your uncle's birthday party uncomfortable, but it makes us better. Third, address racism in your own community. Invest in community organizations that are doing racial justice work. Volunteer for them, contribute to them, and bring others, including your employees, to them. These past weeks, I've seen too many organizations and neighborhood leaders and communities of color scrambling and working so hard to get food, housing, and the most basic supplies for their neighborhoods. While well-resourced communities have kids doing Khan Academy, SAT prep, online piano and art classes. Look, I'm not being critical. I'm just saying that it shouldn't have to be so hard for so many. And here's what you can do at your workplaces. Right now, your black and brown employees are hurting. I know this from the conversations I've had with my own team. They're exhausted, they're scared, they're crying in between WebEx meetings. They don't know how to explain this to their kids. If you have a wellness committee, make space now for your employees of color. Make space for trauma and crisis, but also, Make space for them to share their experiences in majority white workplaces. Let them know that you see them, you care, and that they matter to you. Ask them what you can do for them. You will be stronger and better for it. Second, it's not enough to have a diverse workforce. You have to have people of color in leadership. Tap into affinity organizations in our local schools to keep talent here and seek out graduates who attended historically black colleges and universities. If you don't have a DEI leader, get one and invest in them. Have regular anti-racism and cultural diversity trainings. If you have a diversity and inclusion leader, keep them even in financial hardship. Back in 2008, during the financial crisis, these programs and trainings were the first to go. Let's not let that happen again. And speaking of investing, buy Black. Now is the time for all of us to support and contribute to Black businesses. Order your takeout from Black and Brown restaurants, even if you have to drive some miles for curbside pickup. Support and contribute to the Boston Black Hospitality Coalition, which was created to support Black-owned businesses affected by the COVID-19 crisis. And finally, support good policy. 
I've come to the chamber in the past looking for help on legislation and you have been there. You have been key to passing some really important bills. This morning, some of our legislators of color spoke about the legislative and policy changes they want to see. I support them. I hope you will too. I'd like to close where I started. After watching the video of George Floyd's murder, I sent an email at 2 a.m. to my team. They say that nothing good happens after midnight. I'm hoping to buck the trend. I told them that this has been a heartbreaking time for many, but that our collective mission is to not back down. It's to keep fighting for what's right and just and to seize the opportunity we all have to lift up, celebrate, and advance the dignity and opportunity of every human being. Every one of us has a chance to change society and working together, we can. Yes, America is burning, but that's how forests grow. Thank you. Well, um, thank you, um, General, for such a powerful speech and, and call to action, not just for the business community, for all of us. Um, as we uh, as we deal with the, the horrific events of the of the past week, I'm going to go right to a um, to an audience question. Uh, following up on your remarks, you mentioned uh, legislation, and the question was around uh, really recognizing that um, you know, and, and you mentioned it, um, uh, people of color, black people, um, being stopped um, and experiencing. Uh, racism in different forms uh, uh, in their lives. Um, so the question in, is really one focused on um, uh, law enforcement. Um, and, you know, the events in Minnesota, um, we're thankful, of course, didn't happen here in Massachusetts, but some forms of false arrest, police brutality, um, I'm sure you see the complaints about those kinds of things. Um, how is that dealt with in Massachusetts? And is there some form of legislation um, that's required to think about the way that uh, our law enforcement um, departments and people interact with our communities? Um, it's a great question. We can always do more. You know, Jim and, and to the audience, I am I'm proud of and proud to serve with so many uh, members of law enforcement in this state and so many people out there doing really good work in the community. And protecting public safety is a challenge. I think we can always do better. I think that we need to continue to encourage unconscious bias training, something that is uh, now in the academies. Um, but we need to do as much as we can to engage in those kinds of activities, regular programming, regular training, um, so that our folks are better uh, situated to serve uh, the, the community. I think when it comes to legislation, I'm very interested in looking at the various proposals that are out there. I do think we should uh, make sure that we are not in a situation where we allow police officers to move um, from a state where they engaged in bad conduct, illegal conduct, um, hurtful conduct, and come to a place like Massachusetts. We need to make sure there's also transparency um, and data um, being being provided. So I think it's an important question. It's an important time. And this is this is my point about seizing this moment, seizing this opportunity to address the uh, persistent and pervasive disparities that exist in our criminal justice system that are not the fault of law enforcement alone. Um, this is a much larger discussion, a much bigger picture, but I certainly think those proposals are important. Um, so, um, thank you for, for addressing these issues head on and again, such a powerful um, uh, set of comments. Um, you know, it's, it's, um, it's fascinating to think that, um, you know, this, this uh, disease of racism that's manifesting itself now would overcome the attention of, uh, of, of society in the middle of a pandemic, uh, but it certainly has cast the broad shadow uh, right now, I did. You you mentioned um, the the issues revealed by the by the COVID nineteen crisis in our society. Um, so let me ask you a couple of questions about that. Um, 
you know, what, what are some of the learnings? You mentioned some, but of the COVID-19 uh, events. And, you know, how do you think that shapes our future generally and, and maybe even your work as attorney general, um, having gone through the experience of a pandemic? Well, um, I look at the pandemic and, and the discussion that uh, I'm engaged in today about racism as, as so related, you know, and I mentioned, you know, looking at, at the disproportionate numbers of uh, black and brown members of our communities infected with COVID. I mentioned the people who are in our uh, food pantry lines who are uh, serving as essential workers. Um, but I think that uh, what this signals to us is that we've got to do a better job of taking care of the underpinning. The, the, the fabric, the foundational underpinnings of society. You know, immediately I had to put out emergency regulations to stop things like debt collection and price gouging, uh, to support efforts to uh, limit evictions and foreclosures in this time. I mean, people just don't have any room uh, to spare financially to weather this. And I think that, you know, this, those disparities are real. You know, a few years ago, we talked about the fact that the average African-American family in Boston has uh, approximately eight dollars of, of wealth um, versus a couple hundred thousand um, for the average white family. I mean, this stuff is real and it plays out every day. Um, and it's certainly played out uh, in, in who was affected and how uh, by this pandemic. So I hope this serves as the opportunity for us to look at those things and build forward. Think about our carbon footprint. You know, last week, <clears throat> two weeks ago, we put out a report that basically mapped Jim the air pollution quality um, in communities in, in communities of color to COVID infections. And you can see that places that have greater air pollution uh, tend to be lower income communities, communities of color. And as a result, they have worse public health. Um, I think that, you know, in addition to using this time to think about what fewer cars on the road has meant, and what telecommuting, working remotely, has meant for reducing our carbon footprint. Think about what that is meaning right now for the health and well-being of residents in those communities too. So let's build on that. That's how I think of these things, Jim. Mm -hmm. um, again, use this as a time to recognize uh, the fragilities and and let's move forward. I'll add one comment uh, <clears throat> about the healthcare system. I think that this has really exposed. Uh, the fragilities within our healthcare system. And I think collectively, uh, providers, our AMCs, community hospitals, insurers, we have got to get together and figure out our research institutions uh, because our colleges and universities are so tied to those institutions. Not only are they an economic lifeblood you know, of, of this region and this economy, uh, they're also really important to furthering uh, public good. They've been tested and they've been extremely disrupted. Um, it wasn't a great scenario for them to begin with. We've got to figure out a way collectively working together as we build forward to come out of this and survive and ensure that you know, entities beyond our wonderful AMCs um, are, are, are protected and, um, and, and able to survive. And that, that's a challenge. I don't know the answers, but I look forward to engaging in that discussion. Okay. Um, you, you address the issue of, of workers and you know expanded uh, I think people's normal definitions of what an essential worker is and correctly so uh, we've learned so much about what's essential in our lives uh, during this crisis and now we're into the return to work phase uh, and when I talk to the leaders and CEOs of Boston, Greater Boston's business community um, they always start with that sentiment of protecting their, their workforce as they come back to work and and doing all of the all of the right things. Um, however, they do raise issues of liability, um, particularly uh, around difficult employee kinds of situations. Um, people that might be uh, in a vulnerable demographic, for example, uh, who uh, or people who might um, might have been exposed but come into the workforce. And how do you? How do you protect the rights of that worker while at the same time protecting the rights of the other workers who don't want to get exposed? Um, so there's all sorts of liability uh, issues that get posed as we return to work. And I know at the federal level, there's conversation at the state level. What's your thinking on uh, that balance between um, the, the, the right 
sort of approach of protecting the workforce, but also um, dealing with these difficult sort of almost no right answer kinds of questions. Yeah, you're right, Jim. These are thorny issues and we haven't confronted some of this before. I think we've got to work together. I mean, my office uh, early on got behind the legislation that provided immunity to healthcare providers during this emergency. That was imperative because they needed to be able to provide the care uh, that needed to be provided in the kind of uh, emergency situations that they were called to respond to. I think we need flexibility. I think we do this by bringing people together, uh, people from uh, the community that, that advocate for and promote worker safety. Also, um, employment side, management side, attorneys. You know, an example of this is, I think that we worked really well together on, on pay equity, for example. Um, my office, the business community, I, I use that as an example of, I think, what we need now. We need to figure this out together because there is a balance, right? Um, there is a balance uh, with, with all of this. And I'm not going to pretend to have the answers to a number of the employment uh, scenario questions that have been raised. Fortunately for everyone, I have a wonderful team in Fair Labor, and they've been, I think, helpful to employers in this time and employees with a lot of FAQs on our COVID-19 site. Um, so, so look at those, but that's, that's my commitment, Jim. I think we've got to really have some flexibility, realize that the game has changed. Um, also realize though that, you know, as much as we want the economy to reopen and we desperately do, we desperately need it. We just have to make sure that we take the steps to put in the right amount of attention to public safety, otherwise public health, otherwise, you know, we're going to find ourselves shut down again, and, and we don't want to see that. Yeah. Um, you mentioned the, uh, the, your COVID-19 site that you um, stood up making information available um, to frontline workers and others. Could you talk a little bit about more about what's available on that? What kind of resources are available on that site? Yeah, well, um, I think we did a couple of things. One, um, in the early days, I formed a COVID-19 response team in my office. So we had our consumer protection folks out there trying to hustle to get refunds on travel plans or student travel, um, Boston Sports Club memberships. We had our uh, Medicaid uh, fraud team out there investigating nursing homes, um, some of those you've read about. Our uh, financial services group, you know, working directly with insurers, asking them uh, to uh, reduce premiums, for example, um, during this time. And utilities, who we uh, worked with in, in, in getting them to, you know, and, and shutoffs during this time. So, you know, my office, look, uh, we cover a lot of territory and, you know, the team has been working very hard on that. An area we paid particular attention to though, Jim, is um, addressing vulnerable communities. And so we made available both digitally through our website, but also through webinars and Zooms, um, material, multilingual material to communities in particular need. I also worked, we also worked to produce in more than 10 languages, simple flyers, sort of so people could understand their rights um, and could understand what they needed to do, including go to the hospital if you're feeling sick. Don't avoid taking your child to, uh, to get a vaccination. We delivered those and put those in, in kits that hospitals were sending out to communities with PPE, um, with food pantry boxes and the like. We've had that role and engagement and really trying to reach communities um, that you know, have been, for a lot of the reasons I talked about today, disconnected from government. One particular thing that I'm proud of is our work in building standing up frontlinema.org. We recognized early on that our first responders, our frontline workers in hospitals and elsewhere, they needed help. Every day they were subjected to trauma and uh, unimaginable uh, workload and, and stress. And so we reached out to HubSpot and IDEO, two local wonderful companies. And within about four or five days, we built a, a website, frontlinema.org. Go to it today if you haven't already. Basically, it was a website where we could um, make, with a click of a button, available to, to, first, to uh, frontline workers information about how to get free and discounted meals, how to get hotels. We reached out to hotels, actually, and worked out agreements where they would make rooms available to people where they could quarantine or stay in between shifts. Um, there's a button there on, on self-care. We had folks from MGH help us build that out. Um, it's a really cool site and been used by many. There's a 
nurse down on the north, uh, south shore who works in a Boston hospital who was able to get emergency childcare through the website that we set up. We also added a heroes page and I encourage and appreciate you know, those who posted uh, to it, signs and posters thanking our frontline workers. You know, that was something that we saw a need for. We built this out, and uh, I, I, I'm, you know, I'm, it, it, uh, it, it's an example of us trying to be nimble and responsive in this time. Right. Um, we have a question um, regarding uh, rent and mortgages. Um, the longer this crisis goes on, uh, the more stress that puts on people trying to keep up with their rent, trying to keep up with their mortgage payments. Uh, and I know that the banks are, are doing a lot to try to work it out. Um, what's your thoughts on that? How much protection can we can we offer to people, or how, how do we sort of approach it so that <clears throat> come September, October, um, you know, we don't have a, a massive influx of difficulties in the rental and yeah. the mortgage market? Yeah, I think I think that's the timeline we need to be looking at. You know, I started in the Attorney General's office back in 2007, 2008, so the height of the, the financial crisis. And we certainly want to avoid um, the scenarios that we, that we saw then. Um, I think that we've got to have close communication between our financial institutions, our banks, um, our legislature. We should be looking at what needs to happen here proactively now to address that. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm very much um, interested in engaging in that. And in fact, my team already is looking at it. it is, a difficult situation and I you know uh, relatedly um, want to talk about PPP I mean one of the areas that we have been really focused on and you heard me harp on this uh, on national media in letters to Congress and elsewhere um, got a bunch of AGs to, to sign together and advocate it's for small businesses PPP was a well-intentioned program right and it was stood up quickly but there were some real issues uh, with it because the, the money simply has not flown enough uh, enough to our uh, small businesses, you know, our businesses with less than less than 20 employees. I mean, we've got 122,000 small businesses, I think, in Massachusetts. And behind every small business, I think about the owner, the employee, you know, and their families. The fact of the matter was, money wasn't getting through. And you know, I talked to um, I talked to, to various banks. Um, they were frustrated because they didn't get the guidance either from the SBA and the federal government. So, you know, this is something we've got to continue to pay attention to. I've also called for specific targeting of funds to minority owned businesses who simply lack the resources, the lawyers, the accountants, you know, sometimes the banking relationships to, to, to help um, get those funds. So, you know, I am very much, you mentioned rent mortgages, you know, the housing market, um, uh, I also think about what's happened with our small businesses and, you know, we've got to work within Massachusetts to take care of our own, do what we can do on the state level, but work really closely with the delegation and, and advocate for what we need from the federal government right now. Yeah. Um, another uh, issue, I mean, one that you and I have worked on for a number of years is the whole student debt crisis. Mm -hmm. and the CARES Act suspended um, uh, payments, but uh, through September, uh, but that's only a couple of months away now. I mean, what are your thoughts on, I know you keep an eye on this, what are your thoughts on that uh, pending kind of issue? Yeah, uh, really important issue, uh, as, you, as you know. Um, and I know how important it's been to the chamber. I appreciate our work together on the student debt working group. So I think a few things. Um, we're working right now with servicers to stop any wage garnishments um, and unnecessary collections. That's got to continue. We're working with some of the credit agencies um, to ensure appropriate credit reporting. But I think that uh, a few things, we need to continue to hold the DeVos administration, the Department of Education accountable. Uh, we need to have them working for student borrowers, um, helping solve the problem instead of uh, creating more, more issue and headache. Um, you know, I think that we, uh, you know, ultimately Congress is going to have to figure out what to do with some of this. But, you know, um, debt's only, the debt load's only gotten worse uh, for our, our students. And frankly, you know, relatedly, uh, our colleges and universities are really suffering too. I mean, these are really hard times when you're doing the math and trying to figure out, you know, a path forward. But, um, 
we've been focused in the immediate on making sure that the protections provided to student borrowers under the CARES Act are met. Um, I sometimes get complaints to this day about that and we'll get out there and reach out to services and enforce that. But, you know, I think it's a really important discussion that we've got to the chamber, my office, you know, we've got to engage directly with our delegation on this and advocate for sensible um, policies with respect to, to student loan debt. Yeah. Um, you mentioned, um, and we, we have a question on it now, um, uh, what's happened in long-term care and nursing home facilities? Um, last time I looked, I think 62% of the deaths uh, from COVID-19 had occurred in those types of facilities. Um, what can you tell us about sort of that whole uh, investigation and, and, and what's going on there? I just find it heartbreaking. You know, um, as you say, over half of our deaths have been in long-term care facilities. There are 80 facilities in Massachusetts reported recently by the Globe that have had over 20 deaths. I mean, it's amazing, right? 50 deaths here, 64 deaths here, 72 deaths here. And certainly some of the circumstances seem, um, seem preventable, uh, certainly tragic. My office opened an investigation immediately into the soldiers' uh, home in Holyoke. Uh, we've also opened other investigations as well. We're going to continue to do that, that work and uh, hold those accountable who need to be held accountable. But more than that, Jim, I think that this has exposed the problem with having an under-resourced uh, long-term care uh, system. I mean, it's just, we've got an aging demographic here, um, but we still haven't figured out a way to ensure that those facilities um, are operating and have what they need. And, you know, I, I know a lot of nursing home workers and administrators who tried very, very hard. Um, a lot of them simply lacked uh, the PPE in this particular instance. Um, and had trouble getting it. Um, you know, there weren't, I think, some adequate controls and reporting um, in place in terms of, you know, infections they were seeing and, and getting that information to, to, to public health officials. So I think it's really exposed the problems here. And I think, again, collectively, we've got to figure out a path forward because the system isn't working. And, you know, it, it breaks my heart to think about what we've done to the oldest generation. You know, and the way in which they've died too. So many of them alone. Um, um, one of the things my office did, you know, this was a cool story. I had a, a chief of, of one of my criminal divisions whose mother-in-law was in a nursing home and then died of, of, of COVID. She suggested, you know, why don't we get a tablet for everybody in the nursing homes so that they can communicate real time right now with loved ones on the outside. And we reached out to terrific business partners, um, uh, Walmart, uh, Microsoft, um, and others. Um, and, uh, you know, we're able to secure uh, tablets. Um, so now anyone who needs one, we can get you a tablet, you know, to have in the nursing home so that you can, can communicate. And, you know, that was a positive, but yes, to your, to your question, we need to, we need to revisit and really, um, rethink how we provide long-term care to our aging demographic. They, uh, they deserve a lot better than they're getting. And um, we collectively need to work to make that happen. Um, you, you've been a, among the attorney generals in the various states, you've been a leader. One of your tactics is, is collaborating um, and sharing information. Uh, and we've seen that many, many times over the past six years. Um, what are you talking about now? What, do you, what, what kinds of things are on the minds of attorneys general across the country, both as it relates to the COVID-19 crisis and the reaction to the George Floyd um, situation? I think most immediately it is, it is about uh, the George Floyd you know, situation, what's happening in our cities uh, with protests, with, with violence um, erupting in some places. Um, we have a lot of talks and, and compare notes. You know, unfortunately what we've seen in a lot of places, from Minnesota to Philadelphia, even to here, we see um, outside groups and agitators, people who are, you know, some of this is Antifa, um, not associated with these protesters, not associated with the movement for equality and, and justice, but rather looking to stir up trouble. And, you know, unfortunately, uh, we've seen people come in from out of state, uh, both to Worcester last night and, and to Boston, 
uh, to just try to wreak havoc and you know, in, in no way supportive of the, of, of, of the movement. So we spent a lot of time comparing notes on that. Um, you know, last night we were all on the phone together because Donald Trump said something about sending the military in to our states. And we're all like, okay, like there is a constitution. Part of our job is to enforce the constitution. And um, yeah, so we all like to, to, to look at that. And of course he doesn't have the authority to do what he, what he uh, says he's, he's, go he's going to do. Um, I think the coronavirus, we were on the phone, you know, two, three times a week, all comparing notes about, you know, what we were doing on consumer issues, on law enforcement issues, on, you know, engaging with our healthcare institutions, protecting frontline workers. That work continues. I mean, I'm chair of the Democratic Attorneys General Association. I like to think I work well with all of my colleagues, but, you know, we are on calls just about every week where, you know, uh, historically we've been talking about you know, the different actions that, that we're going to collectively take, some of these multi-states um, and, and the like, but it's definitely changed the last 12 weeks to, you know, all COVID all the time to now, uh, what do we do with an America burning and how do we move forward? We represent law enforcement. We're the chief legal officers in our states. And I think that, you know, we all have assumed, you know, a position of leadership right now, and we're just trying to figure it out. Um, I have a bit, it's interesting. I ha, we worked really hard the last few years to diversify our ranks and um, elections, you know, we had some pretty terrific elections and, you know, um, I have many black and African-American colleagues now um, who ha, I've been having some real, real personal conversations with um, over the last couple of weeks, uh, particularly on, on issues of racism and race and how we can use our voice uh, to to address that, but that's um that's what's happening. I think in the AG ranks right now. Yeah, uh, you anticipated a, a a question in the queue about uh, the president's comments about sending in the military and and your your reaction to that, the legality of of, of that whole suggestion. Um, well, it's it's not just the legality, right? It's also a stupid thing to do. Um, it's not going to help anything, right? I mean, this is part of the problem. We need to 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 push for de-escalation and a calming, and you know, uh, restore a, a semblance of uh, of order and and recognize that there is so much more in common that we share. You know, I think most people in this country, the vast vast majority of people in this country support equality and justice. I talked today about ways to better acknowledge it, own it, you know, and make it so. Um, but you know, unfortunately, we've seen this really uh, pernicious, ugly, small element. You know that. I'll say it, I've said it before, that has been, uh, I, in, in many ways, I think, given license by uh, a president who does uh, not seem to recognize the uh, significance of his word or his position. Um, and that's really eroded and, uh, and, and been so corrosive. So we're just going to continue to take that on, you know, where we, where we see it. But uh, I can tell you, having, talking, having spoken with law enforcement here, local police, state police, you know, we we really don't need uh, we don't need soldiers in our streets. Yeah. So, um, question uh, uh, about um, uh, undocumented immigrants in this crisis. Um, uh, you know, setting aside the debates and so forth, um, people are here and they're hungry and they need help and they need shelter. Um, you know, has your office seen um, some issues arise during this crisis oh, uh, yeah. in terms of access to food and being able to, to um, seek help um, as they're undocumented? And how are we dealing with that? These are the communities that are hurt first and worst, you know, by something like the COVID pandemic. And we've seen it play out here. You've seen the, the rates in Chelsea and Brockton and Lynn and elsewhere. Um, Chelsea, you know, had higher uh, rates of infection than most all the boroughs in, in New York. I remember one Friday afternoon, I got a call from Gladys Vega over at the Chelsea Collaborative. She is a fantastic leader, non-elected, but among the most powerful leaders I know in the state. And she takes care of her community. Um, and She's desperate for food. She had people in, in, in line for the food pantry and they were running out of food. She also had people in line who were coughing, who were sick and had no place to go because they didn't want to return to their apartments with um, so many family members you know, there and at risk. So she was desperate. I, um, 
I called the governor and, and, and he responded right away um, and, um, you know, got food and resources out there. But um, I visited a couple weeks later um, and, and handed out uh, that morning, it was diapers. Um, honestly, it was so, uh, it was really something to see lines stretch city block after city block of people waiting patiently. Some who had obviously just come from work, lining up for the most basic of supplies. Um, one thing that I've dealt with as Attorney General is the fear that's out there. Because Donald Trump threatened to essentially um, make it impossible for people uh, who are undocumented to seek you know, food stamps, um, child care, health care in some instances, there's a lot of fear right now. There was a lot of fear that people had. If I go to the hospital, if I seek help, help they're going to collect my information. They're going to turn it over to ICE. I'm going to get detained. I'm going to get separated from my family. That stuff is real. And so we have worked hard as an office to penetrate that. We created whole flyers in multiple languages to say people, it's safe. Go to the hospital. Don't put your kids or family at risk. The government here in the Commonwealth has your back. You know, that is, that is so, so important. But it's in these times, Jim, where you see the, the consequences of that kind of rhetoric and it's been more than rhetoric, as we've seen people literally detained and rounded up. Um, uh, you know, their immigration courts have just stopped. It's that that re that 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 isn't just rhetoric. It's real. It's real. And I think collectively, I'm proud of the government here. I'm proud of the business community here for standing strong with our immigrant communities. And you know, uh, we're going to need to as we move forward. All right. So um, maybe one final question. Um, you open by um, asking the audience, uh, will we seize the opportunity? And you laid out some prescriptions for that focused on workforce, child care, health care, the digital divide, uh, and others. Um, uh, how can we help? What's the, what's the sort of closing call to action to the greater Boston business community and beyond? Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, Jim. Um, I think that we should engage with you on, on all those subject areas, you know, my team, your team, um, on healthcare, on childhood, on transportation, you know, on all these issues, right, as we go forward. But if there's anything I ask of people today, listen to, go back and listen to, we'll probably um, send it out, the last part of, of my talk this morning, where I've given you some ideas about what you can do, what we can do individually right now. Uh, what we can do within our community, and what we can do within our workplaces. If we don't solve, if we don't acknowledge and solve, address the uh, racial disparities that have persisted in this country for centuries, we're not going to uh, not only get out of this crisis, we're not going to have any shot of getting to where we need to be. And I have every bit of faith in the people of this state. I've had the privilege of serving the last six years here and I've seen, you know, what it means as I look across right now down the Charles, you know, uh, and, and this beautiful city, um, and this beautiful state, we have the capacity, we have the competence, um, and we have the compassion to get this done. So for those of you who are watching TV at night dismayed by what's going on, I understand that dismay. I understand the concern. I truly believe, though, that the path forward is taking up the mantle and taking on some of those things I suggested today. I know others will have other suggestions as well. That's what we need to do. But as I closed with, you know, America's burning, but that's how forests grow. Well, well Attorney General Mari Haley, thank you, not just for your powerful comments today, but for really making your life's work um, a focus on civil rights and protecting uh, all people uh, and, and for the call to action today. And we look forward to working with you on all of those issues going forward. Um, well, thank you. Thank, thank you, Jim. You. My best to well, you and to your members. Before we close, I want to highlight a couple of uh, upcoming virtual events tomorrow at 2 p.m. Uh, for the next installment of our Future of Boston series. We'll hear from local and national leaders working in the hospitality, travel, and tourism industry, the third largest employer uh, in terms of industries in Massachusetts, on the impact of COVID-19 and what will return uh, look like in those industries. Uh, and on Monday, June 29th, from 3.30 to 5, we'll be holding our first ever fully virtual annual meeting 
individual tickets and various levels of sponsorship are available. So please take a look at the Boston Chamber website for information uh, about that and all of our programs. Uh, thank you again to Attorney General Mari Healy and thank you uh, for, to all of those who joined us today. That concludes today's session.